The Rice Ricky Sanchez podcast is presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Sign up for DraftKings Sportsbook by using promo code RTRS and brought to you by Body Bio. Get 20% off anything at bodybio.com with using code RTRS20. Cornblow and Cornblow, the official law firm of the process. And stateside, Urban Craft Vodka, the official sponsor of the Corner 3 newsletter with Zoe. Statesidevodka.com is where you get it. I normally, when we do the night pod and I have stateside, I'll show the stateside. But as we are recording at a time that is not really stateside productive for me, I will not be drinking stateside. The On the show today, the Sixers open up their season losing to the Celtics. It almost seems as if any beginning or end of the season pod we ever do always seems as if this is the podcast we're doing where Celtics fans are listening to us be negative about the Sixers. So I'd like to welcome Celtics fans. As well, KOC profiles Daryl Morey. AU says the regular season doesn't matter. Sixers Adam makes some regular season predictions that we'll go over as well. Uh, I did mention stateside Urban Craft Vodka. Look, if you're going to get up at 3 a.m. to do a podcast, I wouldn't recommend drinking stateside vodka. But any other time, stateside vodka, the vodka sodas, and of course, the wonderful Surfside vodka and tea. And by the way, you can get stateside in any of the states, any of the states. They ship everywhere. When you go to statesidevodka.com, choose the Passion Spirit Store, and you can get it shipped anywhere. Of course, if you're in PA, uh, New Jersey, Delaware, you can do the distillery store. But if you want to do any other place, go to the Passion Spirit Store right there at statesidevodka.com. Without any further ado, Amos and the chef. Welcome to the Right Streaky Sanchez podcast. I'm Spike Keskin, along with a guy that I don't actually have a thing to say for because I didn't think about it before I introduced him. That is one Mike Levin. I love when we do podcasts when we're in different days. <laughs> There's a separate day for you and I. There's been like a few the of past. these in history. A few. Yeah. yeah. Doing a little coffee this morning. Morning. <sighs> so the Sixers are 0 and 1 on a pace to lose all 82 regular season games mm, if this pace tough. were to continue. Yeah, they would They would not hit the rover. No. If they uh, lost all 82. Celtics would go way over, of course. So, um, hey, look, uh, there's obviously a lot of season to go, of course, and this is just one game. But I will say, based on what we saw in this one game, the Sixers are not currently, not that I expected them to be right away, but they are certainly not currently on the level of a team like the Celtics right this second. It does not seem like. I mean, it's one game. I, I don't know that I would say that specifically. The, hmm. It was a frustrating game in the sense that, like, this this is what the Celtics do to the Sixers. Like, the Celtics are a team primarily filled with guys from that are like six four to six eight mm -hmm. and they switch and they move and they're fast and they run it down your throat and that was i think exemplified by the fact that the celtics had 24 fast break points and the sixers had two and the two fast break points that the sixers had was a tobias harris fast break with like 20 seconds left so it was everything the Sixers did was hard and almost everything the Celtics got was easy. Um, but I think that's the stuff that you can clean up. I think that's communication stuff. I think that's getting to know 
We need your teammates f- better and a few more years. Just a few more years. No, but uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, there, there's interesting things to talk about this. Where it's like, how can the Sixers win with like a very traditional defense with a center that you don't want to leave the paint and a couple guards that are have a tough time defending? I thought Harden was atrocious on defense tonight. Uh, yeah, tonight for me, it's tonight. Yeah. Um, and I think Maxi looked overmatched. I don't think he was terrible. I think it just was like mismatch, exploited. Whereas Harden, God, it seemed like there were so many just like wide open either fast breaks or just like, and there goes Tatum or Brown or Marcus Smart or Derek White or Malcolm Brogdon, like just blowing by Harden or Maxi around the rim, unable to stop them. And so that's frustrating. Those are like, um, like a, that's a systemic issue. That's a very like, this is a core problem with the team that obviously Harden and Max are going to play a lot of minutes together. But like, you know, they're not. It's the, the disparity is greater in this game than it will be going forward. It's stuff. It's stuff you can clean up and and focus on and stuff. So I, I would say I'm not worried broadly, but this is if you're going to have two small guards or two like not defense first guards and a center that you don't want to switch everything with. And you really gotta, you really gotta win the other stuff. And the Sixers didn't win the other stuff tonight. Well, let me ask you then. Then, then where does the 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 notion that the Sixers could? I I look at them from a all right. So let's compare the. And I'm I'm not being overly negative. I like I don't I don't want to get into that. But we talk we talk about the Sixers being like this top five defense. And I look at them, and that I see Harden and and Maxi in the starting lineup. And then I see really like two power forwards playing at the same time. And then we talk about what the Celtics defense is able to do. And they're able to do it by being, you know, being able to switch everything because, uh, because of their size and their athleticism. And because it's the year 2022 in the NBA and you you sort of, a a lot of teams switch everything. And you look at the Sixers lineup and you're like, well, how is that going to be a top five defense? Like with 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 Maxi and Harden and two power forwards playing at the same time, and and we see, I, I guess my frustration is like, is exactly what you said, but like I'm more frustrated by it. My frustration is here we are, and B looks like he like out of sorts the entire game offensively against Boston again. They look oh, much. I, could, I disagree with that also. Oh come on, and Beat had six turnovers. And I think like three of them were on just like the the bullshit careless Embiid stuff that I well, have been railing about for years, where he's just like kind of not looking and just like kind of tosses it aside, and then it gets picked off and goes the other way with it. But I thought he handled double teams pretty well tonight. I think that he was he allowed the the read to come, uh, allowed, allowed the double team to come, made the read off of it, and kicked it out to solid shooters. He had how many assists? He had five assists, twenty six and fifteen. Like I thought he was good, nine of eighteen from the field. He missed threes. But I think he'll, those will come. He should be welcoming the double team. And I think tonight he started to a little bit more than he has in the past. It's like simple shit. Like anticipate the double team, kick it out to the open shooter. Like that kind of stuff, make your pay. And I thought he was I thought he was totally fine with that. I think he tried to do too much. Like <laughs> this is the same again, shit we've all we we've totally, said for but like when years. He, but this yeah. but these are clean that that those are the choices that he he is making. Mm. Like and he has a point guard now in Harden that like he got easy looks. Like he got so many more easy looks out of the role with Harden. Um and even a couple times there, he had a he had a pick and roll with Maxi. Maxi drives. The I forget who the big was, but it might have been Blake Griffin. But Blake stays with Embiid. Maxi gets a wide open roll to the rim. And just like him doing that and being a threat to do that is so huge for the offense, and they can get good stuff out of it. I mean, the, the Sixers offense like looked relatively good. It was it was definitely like uncomfortable sometimes, and they turned they had dumb turnovers and stuff, and the fast breaks are demoralizing after after those turnovers. But like they got good looks out of it. I thought Harden played really well. I thought Embiid played like relatively well. Um, it's just you got to clean up this, the careless shit, and I think. As far as like, we keep saying that, and we've been saying that for years. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's those are like regular every team problems when you're not clicking on all cylinders, when you're not quite like. There's 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 few, there's only so many things that could be going wrong when you're losing, and it's like you're not you're not focused, you're not making the right passes, like as far as 
the team playing like pretty cohesively together. I thought they they did. They got. I was not concerned about the offense tonight. It was the, it was the defense and like how many like wide open looks they got. That was that was frustrating me more and more. So, hmm. I you know it's weird. I feel like we watched a different game. <laughs> well, I watched it tonight. You might have watched it. A couple of times. <laughs> All right. So what do you? want to start with Embiid because I let talk about Embiid I think more broadly because I I actually felt like he looked um I don't know I guess I I just I wanted to see a little more cohesiveness to him in offense than I saw and I I didn't feel like I saw that and as well I, and I don't mean to be mood doctor guy but he looked miserable the entire night yeah he didn't seem pumped I agree it, with that and and isn't that like in the season the best roster ever and yada 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 and so on and so forth? Doesn't that kind of suck? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I I I would hate to fucking go into that goddamn building in front of those fucking people, yeah, and turn the ball over, doing pointless shit. Like I would hate that. I would hate, that would be demoralizing for me. It was demoralizing watching it. I will say just a little background. I watched the Phillies game. I watched, and then I went. Then I coached Alyssa's basketball game, and won. By the way, Spike, four and Congratulations. one. Congratulations! Thank you. Called a very, very. There we go. Oh, a cheer! That's good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Called an important timeout. You guys good. are undefeated. Yeah. No, four you, and one. Four oh, four and one. one. Okay. Um, was the ref I, game I, the game that you lost? No, the the game that we lost was to a better team. Okay. There's one really good team that okay. that is that is just like should be in a higher division. Okay. Um, but uh. I watched the game with Jake Pavorsky, who was in Los Angeles. We were oh, what's he together. doing out there? He's Mickey doing Mouse some, Club uh, the, filming? The, the tournament stuff. Uh, I saw they're uh, launching soccer now, too. Yeah. yeah, so he's doing that. So we were watching. We, we went, went to a bar to watch the uh, Phillies game, which is wild that the Phillies are in the NLCS and succeeding so far. Um, and it was one of those, like, every other TV's thing. And the Sixers game was playing in between the the Phillies games. And so I was like, you just, I was like, I really don't want to watch this right now, but then it's, you know, you're distracted by it. So I, I kind of watched the game twice. It was kind uh, of a, kind of a big night for Jake Bavorsky, Noah Vonley's. Uh, yeah, we were talking J- about it. We <laughs> talked about it a lot. We talked about it a lot. <laughs> he's a believer. Definitely. He, has, he believer. still is a believer. He's, he's still happy about it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I, I just, I felt like Joel, here, here are my, yeah. my top line Joel things. And I don't want to be, uh, I, I don't want to be like romanced by going back and look at the numbers because the numbers do look good, mm-hmm. but I do feel like, like, like he had a run of, from a, from an offensive standpoint, he had a run of like looking good for the last six minutes of the game where it didn't really seem to matter all that much anyway. Like I just, I just felt like he didn't look particularly that here are my, my, the things that worried me a little bit on beat. He didn't look po- particularly co I didn't think he looked particularly cohesive with, with Harden most of the game. And then there was the mood thing. And then also like, I guess I just felt like I wanted to see him look a little more, uh, springy or see something new after a big off season or something like that. And all, all like, I just had all of these feelings go through me is like, Oh my God, he's fucking in MVP runner up two years in a row. He's 29 is the best team he's ever had. He still can't fucking do anything against the Celtics. And we, this is the same thing. And, and to that, that was like my headline with Embiid is like, ah, I just wish, wish I saw a guy come out here ready to just fucking mow people down. And I didn't think that I saw that. I think he mowed people down quite a few times in this game here. My thing is I, I thought he was more successful in this game than in many other games in, against the Celtics. I thought he finished pretty well. He, his mid-range was working. I thought he passed out of the post enough. The turnovers were like just focus stuff that he just wasn't doing. I, and it's really about like, for me, the thing with Joel, he can do everything on a basketball court. There's not anything that he can't do. He's an incredible player. He's everything. But he has to know when like not to do it, when not to try to to like show to flash his handle because he's seven fucking foot two and he doesn't need to be driving in from 25 feet away like that it's that kind of stuff that frustrates me it's that kind of stuff that if we can if he can clean that up if he can trust his teammates enough that when i pass the ball i'm going to get the ball back i'm going to get the ball back in a better position then he won't have as many turnovers the offense that won't lead to like because if he turns the ball over at the top of the key 
he's not getting back to chase down a block from like a Marcus Smart or whoever. So that's an easy layup. Like it's an easy dunk. It's an easy fast break. It, it's such a momentum swing. He can do everything, but he just like has to be more disciplined and focused of about not always like forcing it. And it feels like tonight he forced it. And when he didn't force it, the game came to him. I thought he rolled pretty well. I thought he like when when the floor was spaced for him. I thought he either hit shots or uh, or kicked it out. He had a couple of really nice like interior finishes around Noah Von Ley or Al Horford. Like it wasn't a perfect game. It wasn't the best game they ever played. But against Boston, against a team that's given him trouble in the past, like I thought he was fine. the The problem wasn't like oh they're doing something crazy to to get him out of whack it's just him trying to do too much and again it seems like boston and serrano he's got to be more disciplined about when he's driving where he's driving from how many dribbles he's taking because that's inviting the those long long armed physical defenders to come over and poke it out and he's just like you don't need to do it you, you now have a team that they can give you the ball back though like that's why you get into your sets quicker so that he can with 14 seconds left okay this didn't work kick it out to harden kick it out to maxi to bias whatever Get it back to him. Let him reset. Let him repost. The defense can't keep rotating multiple times in a possession back onto him. That's that's the frustrating part for me. But I I think he can do everything. I just I want him to honestly do less and trust his teammates more. I feel like I I can see Daryl right now going, you guys, it's like it's one game. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It is one game. <laughs> this is this why I like Mike and better. The Phillies are in the NLCS. <laughs> and the Eagles are six and zero. And Alyssa's uh, team is four and one. And I'm the coach of the fucking year. Wait a minute. Her team can't get included. They're in Los Angeles. They're not a me. Philadelphia team. I'm okay. there. It's a Philadelphia yeah. team. <laughs> Body Bio, sponsor of uh, Right Ricky Sanchez. We love Body Bio. Body Bio cares about your health. They think you should probably sleep a little bit longer than three and a half hours, but but in general, they care about your health. Body Bio is our the only supplement company of the Ricky. They are from right there in South Jersey. They're family owned, family operated. Blah, 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 blah. That, that's not the important thing. You don't care who owns the company. What you care about is what do they make? Does it work? Body Bio has right now put out uh, September 20th. I think they put it out. So it's been out for a month now. The only gut supplement you need. Gut plus. Gut plus. You might be taking a probiotic. You might have heard of probiotics. Look, lots of people take probiotics. Nobody's getting hurt by the probiotics. But the problem is that most people taking probiotics is not doing what they want. They want to get rid of those, those symptoms that bloat or whatever. And the reason it's not working is because there's hundreds of strains of probiotics and you need the exact right one for it to work. So that's why Body Bio comes out with Gut Plus. No probiotic. Prebiotic, postbiotic is what it does. The prebiotic goes into your gut, gets rid of all the bacteria you don't want, and what it allows your body to do is create its own probiotics naturally by getting rid of the bad bacteria. The postbiotic comes in, gets rid of all of those symptoms that you don't want, that bloat that you don't want. If you're going to take one gut supplement, it is Gut Plus. Get it at bodybio.com. Use code RTRS20 for 20% off while you're there. Check out Elite. Keep yourself hydrated correctly without any sugar or artificial flavors or colors or whatever. Uh, check out liposomal vitamin C. All the things we've talked about on uh, Rights to Ricky Sanchez. Go to bodybio.com. Use code RTRS20. 20 for 20% 20 off gut plus that's right gut plus what a name love it gut plus coming next year gut minus makes your gut terrible can't wait for that one to come out um hard not i i feel like we had games like this last year where he hit a bunch of threes and it's hard for me to tell how happy or not I am with him when the step back's going in. And for some reason, the Celtics, who are a really good defensive team, foul him three fucking times on on uh, on three-point shots. I think it was Charles that said, made a, a pretty salient point. He was like, you're not going to block it. So what are you doing? Like, how many block three-pointers do you see, especially of Harden? Getting baited into that three times is really amusing, and I think a credit to Harden. I just thought he looked he looked fine. He just, like, when the shot's going down like that, it's sort of, I guess, harder for me to tell what was going on. And something they did mention on the broadcast a few times, is like, Sixers didn't have a ton of stuff going to the rim, and there wasn't a ton of Harden stuff going to the rim. A lot of his success, I thought, came from the shoot the the three pointers and then the getting fouled on three pointers a few times yeah i mean i totally agree with that no, no reason to be contesting threes that hard <laughs> that you're not going to block you know unless you're you know matisse or robert williams or something like that the kind of guy that does like 
actually contest shots and blocks them. I just don't think it's it's worthwhile to do. Um, yeah, I mean, he looked bouncier to me. He looked hmm. lighter on his feet. Um, and once a few step backs go in, then they are going after it more. And then you can leverage the threat of the setback, which is what Harden did for you know the the prime of his career, into getting by them once they're like on the on their toes a little bit more. If they're sitting back and like well balanced, then he's not getting by that many people. But he blew by Grant Williams because of uh, uh, because he hit a couple threes in his face, and that is awesome. That's great to see. That's we like that's the kind of that's the kind of performance we need him to to make. Um, I love just watching him run the pick and roll with whoever, whether it's Embiid or or Trez or Tucker, even like PJ Tucker. Yeah, um, I think he just like really manipulates the situation really nicely and can find little pocket passes, little holes, little like hesitations, the waiting a half second to get a guy open. Like it's really impressive to watch. It's very cool. Um, but you know, you still see this some stupid off some stupid like trying to draw the foul and just like give the ball away two points in the other direction. Like that's a real <laughs> gut punch. Those kinds of like, God, those in the, in, a, in a tough game, you know, this is the first game of the season who gives a fuck, but you're just like dying to just not totally give points away. And there, and that is the, you know, the same, both Embiid and Harden are guys who are, who can really give bad body language. Yes. Like both of them are capable of like total taking the air out. Now, I don't know as a fan, as a person just watching it, like I, I feel like the air is out of, out of my balloon. I can only, I don't know what it would be like to be like one of their teammates in that situation to see them like drag. Maybe for them, it's just like, okay, I'm pissed off for a second. I get past it. But I don't know. To me, like those kinds of plays that both of them are capable of making and then, you, you know, pouting about afterwards really is just total. It's a total uh, take the air out of the balloon. But for me, the Harden played great offensively. I thought I was extremely impressed and happy. And he looked like exactly the kind of player we wanted to get when they when we acquired when daryl acquired him last year but the defense was ghastly just <laughs> dying on screens i think there were two possessions in a row in the fourth quarter i honestly thought like did i re did the did i rewind this by accident like where he get he got screened jalen brown comes over and just hits a three as hard and just like kind of pretends like he's trying to fight around the screen it happened on i think back to back or very close to back back to back possessions in the fourth it was brutal um so that was bad. And yeah, I mean, yeah, that the, the defense was the was the issue for me of like how how are you I, I think there on some level like the Celtics hit a ton of like mid range bullshit. The the transition opportunities that the Sixers gave up was was the frustrating part for me. And that is something that you they'll have to they've been bad at, I feel like forever. Have the Sixers ever had a good transition defense? Someone let us know if they've ever have. If yeah, there's I like a quantifiable, like the Sixers during this year were a top, have the Sixers ever been like a top eight transition defense? Because I, I feel like never have I, it's always been like, well, they struggle in transition. It feels like forever. Um, but there were like, the, the Celtics like banked in a couple things and like, it feels like they hit everything in the middle, like everything in the mid range that they just don't normally hit. Like they're a good team, obviously, but like I'm willing to write some of that off of why they shot such a high percentage from the field. But it's the, like Grant Williams didn't miss. He's very good, but he didn't miss. Um, the thing is, the, the the defense, the defense is tough of the, of the and get, allowing transition opportunities and not like being good in transition opportunities. It's funny. You're like, just it, instead of doing a new pod, you're like, Celtics hit a bunch of shots they're not going to normally hit. Sixers bad transition defense. It was like we we should have just like taken a pod from 2018 and loaded it up and see. <laughs> Tell CJ to replace uh, replace the player names and everything else would have been the same. Yeah, I I agree. I I I do worry. You're talking about the like the the sort of bummer body language thing they do. I do wonder. I do worry a little bit that the two leaders of the team are the the two best players on the team or the team that you point out like are, are capable of a lot of bad body language is the, the part of it's not great. Uh, you know, it's funny, like, uh, thigh or not thigh ball, um, uh, maxi. I feel like 
like again, um, like last year, there were times when I, too many times where I was like, he's not involved in any of it, you know? And I think um, it was, it was funny when, when Harden was on the floor without Embiid or Maxi, and it was just like the Harden show or whatever, everything looked sort of like totally natural, knew where everything was supposed to be. And then Maxi's on the floor. And I thought there were too many times where, um, you know, he ended up with 21 points, which is great, but there's too many times where he wasn't involved in the offense at all. And, and one of the things that I hope evolves, and, you know, this was a game where Harden was particularly hot from three. So he had it going, you know, whatever offense revolves around you. I just, it was when neither Embiid nor Harden were on the floor and Maxi, it, it didn't last for long, but it was like the Maxi show or whatever. It was such a relief to see that. I, ju- I guess I just want to see the Maxi show more when those two guys are there and have the offense, whatever that looks like. I don't think I know what it looks like, but ever, whatever that looks like sort of revolve around him. I guess that is, is part of the issue though, that I'm not sure what an offense that's revolving around Tyrese looks like if it's not running up and down the court at full speed. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's one of those weird things where the more, like, I don't think if you could if you could create a team, if you could create the most cohesive offensive unit, even though Harden, Maxi, Embiid, and Tobias are all very good players, they they don't like fit together like a glove, and I think Harden and Embiid are such like heliocentric figures that you can really only figure one of those other guys can be featured in any like stretch. So like Tobias was great in the first half was huge. And then I don't think scored in the second half until like the last minute. And so then it was, it was Maxi that like took over in the second half and kind of kept them afloat for a lot of it. And it's just one of those things where it's like one of those guys feels like they disappear Mm -hmm. for a long stretch of time. Yeah. um, Because of how, even though Maxi is good, has turned himself into a good shooter off the catch, and Tobias, we can talk about, like, really looks like he has committed to being this new version of himself. Um, still not like, like perfect in that sense. Like, there's still neither of them are like, neither of them are several Danny Danny's Green out there. Um, so it's just I, I it, yeah. I mean, I I always feel like I want more Maxi. I always feel like I want more Maxi. What do you I think, think an perfect. offense that is that is like? It, it it just sort of feels like he's doing it when it happens it's like spectacular but I, I can't imagine what a team like where the offense is based around Maxi but also has Embiid and Harden like offensively even looks like yeah do you know what I mean like he's it it it's so uh he goes so fast and so much of it is about like his explosion out of nowhere that two things. One, I don't see, I I don't know how Harden and Embiid fit into that. I'm not saying that they don't or can, I'm just saying, I don't know how. And then the other thing is that like he, uh, even from like a fast base break perspective, 40% of the, of the, you know, of the lineup isn't even, isn't, isn't going to be a great part of that you know, aside from uh, rebounding it and kicking it ahead to him. And then when you think, honestly, the rest of the, f- the starting lineup isn't really going to be a great fast break lineup for Maxi. So um, they did talk about, and we saw a lot of, a, a, a decent amount of Embiid not on the floor, but Harden on, Harden on the floor, Embiid not on the floor, which limits the time that um, that Maxi could be on the floor with neither of them. And you just sort of wonder as time goes on, maybe we see a little bit more of that, a little bit more of Maxi on the floor without those two guys. Yeah, maybe. I think I think it's, it's certainly something that they should tinker with all season long and get comfortable with um, and find guys to have, like find your little, like who is, if it's going to be Trez as the backup center, is like a, is there a Maxi Trez like go-to bread and butter type thing that they could find as the season goes on? Um. Yeah, I mean, he's just he's Maxi always wants to go right, and they know he wants to go right, and he still gets there. Like it's just so rare that the kind of guy that could do that without with his like size deficiencies, and although he's gotten stronger, still like not a not such a sturdy guy. Um, he can still get there, man. He's so fucking fast. It's unbelievable. And he did. He did like there was there was one really nice play where 
He was going to his right. He rejected the screen. Little hesitation. And then just like scooted right by Marcus Smart to finish at the rim with his left. And it was just like such a nice along, along the baseline, which was such a nice play. And it's, it added an element of like, give me some hesitation to his game. Give me a little start and stop. Like, I like the one speed and his one speed is very good. But I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing like what else he can add to his game this year. Um, it's just really impossible to stop with the head of steam. Like even with Marcus Smart, like just like blowing past guys and still finishing in control. As he's going that fast, it's just he's just special, man. We did a DraftKings uh, Ricky same game parlay, and man, we hit everything but the win. Mm. <laughs> it, it was Maxi over. It was the Sixers big three uh, tip off same game parlay. Maxi over seventeen and a half points. Harden over eight eight point five assists. Uh, and Bede over ten and a half rebounds. Sixers money line. I think it was like plus six fifty or something. Man, so close. All right, Vegas Mike. I. I just want to tell Vegas, Mike, that the Phillies are now the favorites to go to the World Series in the National League, minus 185. There it is. How about that? All right. How about that? So Phillies are going up against the Padres today or tomorrow for you. Mm -hmm. It is Nola versus Blake Snell. You want to give me the uh, what you think the money line is on the Phillies to win? Nola versus Snell in San Diego, game two. Um, Give me... Uh, Phillies plus one ten. Phillies plus one hundred five. Not a not a bad guess there. For the the Padres are minus one twenty five. That is at uh, DraftKings Sportsbook, who is Thanks, the official Mike. sportsbook of the uh, of the Ricky. I actually I don't know if the the NFL special that I have is still running, but you should use DraftKings Sportsbook anyway. When you sign up, use uh, code RTRS. The uh, the same game parlays are going on. Of course, they are the the way that you want to play uh, the NFL games on Sundays. As DraftKings is a s- official sports betting partner of the NFL. You see, there's going to be a Black Friday game next year. So pretty soon, we are going to have NFL games. I think. 365 days a year there'll be one every single day and they're all they're all gonna be as bad as so many of them have been yeah <laughs> people are gonna keep watching it does seem like denver is in every prime time everyone game somehow. every single one yeah download the DraftKings sports book up now use promo code rtrs to sign up once again download the DraftKings sports book app now use promo code rtrs DraftKings is an official sports betting partner of the nfl minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply see show notes for details to your point tobias did have a nice little first half there um, and had it going. It was Tobias time. It was a combination of Toby time, but with new Toby. It was like a, a nice, you know, 24 minute run, run of new Toby and uh, and Toby time at the same time. So nice little game for Tobias. Yeah. I mean, three for six from beyond. Hit a couple, missed a couple open ones sort of the end. My, my nephew was texting me that he should quit <laughs> because he missed a couple threes, which is the 13 year old energy that I'm looking yeah. for at all times. Um, yeah, I thought I thought he was I thought he was really good in the first half and just totally disappeared in the second. Like I thought he was, you know, he was shooting without thinking, quick release, moving the ball quickly. Even when he got the ball in the corner with Jalen on him, he kind of just rose up over him, which was cool off a of no dribble. Um, early his first bucket of the season was that like springy off his own putback kind of thing. I thought he was anticipating pretty well. He's fine. I mean, I know you keep calling him a power forward, like, and that's not obviously wrong, but like he's turned himself into a totally fine defender um one-on-one he's got a little bit of anticipation and can like you know pick off a pass here and there if he if he can read the defense or read the offense um if the shots keep going up like they have been a couple mismatches here and there like he's a totally fine player he is not you know contract aside he is not going to prohibit them from winning and uh and that's good and he looks looks healthy i do i i guess i keep calling him power forward i do not like him on the floor with tucker um but that's is what it is. Tucker, by the way, <laughs> seeing him fight for offensive rebounds yeah. was like, I, I don't know. I know the Sixers lost and I, I didn't feel like Embiid looked great and blah, 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 blah. But like, I felt like the Sixers won the championship by getting, like I don't know how many it was, two or three really tough offensive rebounds from PJ yeah. Tucker. Like it was amazing. Great and that see. thing he did, um, I forget, was it Williams who was on the floor and had the ball and PJ Tucker was like doing this thing where he was like slapping the ball, like he was trying to uh, 
frustrate him so he couldn't call timeout. I don't know. He was, he's so irritating and, and great. His shout, like, you know, didn't fall uh, as much as you'd like it to. I, I think he, he had a couple of floaters. He didn't make any threes, but I don't know. It was great seeing PJ Tucker he might, be PJ he Tucker. Hit, he definitely hit a, at least a, th- a three distance one. Maybe his foot was on the line or something. Okay. Um, yeah. It's awesome seeing PJ Tucker be PJ Tucker for us. Like it feels like Embiid at the end of last season was like, man, we've never had a guy like PJ Tucker. And then they got PJ Tucker and now he's on the Sixers playing like PJ Tucker. And that's cool. Yeah. And that's good to see. And it's going to help. And I, I don't disagree that like, you know, perfect world, you would have Mikhail Bridges there instead of Tobias Harris. And then hmm. you're like, okay, great. Uh, but that's not the case. And I don't think it's, I don't think that pairing is, I know it's, it, there's something doesn't feel quite right about it, but it also, I, th- I don't think it's going to prohibit them from, from getting where, where they need to get. I, the, I think, the, oh, sorry. Um, I, I think the problem for me with it is, and, and Toby had two rebounds, is that if you're going to have two guys that are that size and that sort of stuff, you want them to be causing them almost like both to be PJ Tucker. You know, like you want them to be making the other team uncomfortable in some way. And I don't feel like that that pairing makes them uncomfortable in some way. You know, it's just sort of doesn't really fit. Yeah. yeah. In some matchups, I think that it will. I think... Sometimes people's like you're gonna have somebody bad on Maxi or somebody bad on Harden or somebody small on Tobias. I think is usually what's gonna go. And if you double off PJ, then that's him right in the corner, ready to take a very quick catch and shoot, catch and shoot three that he's extremely disciplined about. And so I think Boston's a tough matchup because they have defenders up and down the roster um, and switchable ones. But in other matchups, I, I I think that they will that will be a, a thing that they can exploit. You know, for the deepest Sixers team that we've seen in years, it yeah. felt like their bench fucking sucked. Yeah, it did. Da- Daniel House looked like, I don't know, he, he looked like a small forward size, like Paul Reed or something out there. There was like, the, he didn't, he, he looked co- completely discombobulated and the, and the time he was on the floor, I was looking at George Niang going like, wait a minute, I didn't think you were going to play. Like what's going on here? Um, Thibel didn't really play at all. They look terrible. The bench looked fucking horrible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Melton was <laughs> Melton was okay. Yeah. He had a couple nice plays defensively, but also a couple like got blown by Brogdon a couple times. Um, and I think there's some communication stuff going on. But the, Paul the Reed all, didn't like, play. You know, three of the four four of the nine bench player, four of the nine rotation players are new to the team in Trez, House, Melton, and Tucker. And I think that was very evident with with the bench guys of like kind of not having a great feel for each other yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's Matisse played in like a combined like forty five seconds of game time maybe mm-hmm. um, at the ends of quarters, um, just as like a uh, gimmick type player. Um, no Korkmaz, no nope. Shake, nope, no B-ball Paul, nope. Um, it's a little weird that Shake didn't play. I thought. Yeah, could I he, mean, could he yeah, use I, eight minutes from him? I thought at some point. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's any reason to not go ten deep in October. <laughs> I don't think there's any reason for you know you know we're gonna, I'm gonna uh, I love you know counting the minutes, but thirty seven, thirty eight in a game where you <laughs> were kind of out of it for a while, like that could have that didn't have to happen, um, <laughs> but. Yeah, the bench needs to be better. It just wasn't. They got to figure out a way to make it happen. They they are the deepest team. Like their deepest team is in like they go thirteen deep of playable National Basketball Association level players, <laughs> but they're not right now like effectively crushing anybody. And man, like you know, Tre- Trez was not good tonight. Uh, his plus minus doesn't really tell that story. No, but he wasn't good. Fine, but he wasn't he yeah. wasn't good at all. And like yeah. it should. When it counts, it needs to be Paul Reed. How did he not play a minute though? Isn't that wild? Like how like he didn't play ball? F- yeah. No, I mean I think it's just crazy. As soon as they signed Montrose Harrell, it was like, oh, of course Doc is gonna go to him. Like yeah. of course. He's gonna pretend like he's not going to. And then he's going to. It's like <laughs> you're dating a guy who has cheated on every girlfriend he's ever had. And he's like, no, but this time it's different. And it's like, I don't think it is. But you convince enough people, and then here you go. 
cheating on Paul Reed and me with Montrez Harrell, who is fine. And he's going to be fine. He's going to have games when he looks really, really helpful, carries a second unit, absolutely. But like with the offensive players on this team, they need to be better on defense. And Paul Reed is a massively better defensive player than Montrez Harrell. Um, and you just are going to need to hold up on that end in the playoffs. And as much as weird as he is, freaking Jake Pavorsky was telling me, like, Paul Reed is not, I don't agree with this, but he's like, he's one of the dumbest players in the NBA. I don't agree with that. That's what Jake said. <laughs> That's what Jake said. I don't agree with that. Um, he is weird. He is chaotic. But he makes it happen, and, and it ne- it's a net positive. Um, Did he mean and, dumb as a player or d- dumb as a person who happens to be a player? I think make- as a player on the court. Okay, all right. <laughs> is what I think he was referring wow. to. Wow. Well, um, I hope Jake wasn't hoping for the, the Paul Reed three or whatever is the... Well, I know they played full five on five, but like, I don't think there's going to be a Paul Reed team anytime soon. In the basketball no, because Paul Reed's going to be in the NBA for a <laughs> long time. Isn't it weird that Jake is older than Paul Reed? He is. He's twenty. Jake, of course, he is twenty six. How wow. weird is that? Wow. Crazy. I see. I see pictures of him sometimes, and he's always got like the five o'clock shadow beard or whatever. And I'm like, you're Grown just man. doing that because you can now. Grown man. Yeah. <laughs> Grown man. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I. Whatever. Yes. This is partly why I've been wanting the consolidation trade because there are NBA players on the bench. But maybe that'll happen once it's once you know. Guys are either on this team or on other teams destined to get hurt. And then maybe that'll open something up to happen. But yeah, I just, the the, the biggest thing I watch this game and, and when you watch, it's going to happen when they play Toronto. Maybe it happens uh, against Milwaukee, although with Middleton out, maybe it probably won't. But like you look at, you look at these guys and go like, how are they going to defend the kind of team full of 6'5 to 6'9 wings that can move all over and are quicker and longer than them and is Embiid going to make them pay enough and is Maxi and are Maxi and Harden quick enough to get where they want to um to sort of um get past and overturn the advantage that those teams have with with their length and physicality and I think PJ helps that a little bit at least physicality wise but like it's a different style. The Sixers are playing a different style than almost than almost any other team in the league. And they have to make it work on both ends. They, they have to be a top 10 offense and top 10 defense. And I, I think offense, I'm not worried about. Defense, I think they are susceptible to a lot. By the way, it makes them vulnerable to a couple of teams that I don't think anyone is picking to come out of the East. Like it makes them vulnerable to Toronto who who they've always been vulnerable against, but it makes them vulnerable to Miami, those sorts of teams when Embiid isn't going to go in there if he's bigger than everybody else on the team and score 44 and 18 and make them terrified of going to the lane. You know, it's just everything. And a lot of it was the fast break points. And by the way, they were top five fast break defense in 2017. 16, 17. Yeah. Don't believe it for a second. Well, that was the first, was that the first Simmons year? 16, 17? Yeah. 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 Um, if, if he's not going to obliterate them with being bigger than them, than them, it, that's going to be a problem, you know, like that, that is, that is, they will certainly struggle there. So, yeah. And it, and it'll, it'll come down to like, can you get, can you get more turnovers? Can you get easy buckets and transition? Does that open the door to like, you know, Matisse finding a way for Matisse to be in the rotation um, so that he can at least like wreak some havoc in the passing lanes. Um, yeah. AU wrote a thing for rights to Ricky Sanchez.com. Uh, Andrew Underberger wrote a thing for rights to Ricky Sanchez.com about like watching this season. Andrew, AU going through the motions as I, I think as we could have picked an old podcast, I think this may have been an old column watching a season where the regular season doesn't matter at all. Do you, do you feel like this is any, he wrote it for this year. I was like, is this any different than it has been for the last, like three years, I think. You know? I mean, last season, the regular season didn't matter because the team was going nowhere with a massive hole in their roster that wasn't playing. Um, the year before was the bubble season and then Ben got hurt and stuff. Like, 
I think that there were more things to prove in the past. Like Joel had more things to prove in past years. I think um, they had a little less. It was still like not only Joel, but Joel and Ben. Like, can they coexist? Can can they work together? Is this the year that they figure it out? Is this the year that Ben shoots? Is this the year, et cetera, et cetera. And now you're looking at this team and going like, there's kind of nothing that I need that needs to be figured out. Like no, no individual player needs to prove something new. Like can X player develop X skill that will take this team to greater heights? It's like Max is going to keep improving on the offensive end. It'd be nice if he improves on the defensive end, but that's not something you're like waiting with bated breath on Harden, You just want him to like maintain health and like get everybody organized and, and, and remain healthy for the playoffs and, and defer a lot when he can. And it'd be just need him to stay healthy. Like there's it's, that's why I'm so intent on like finding like let's tinker, let's let guys sit, like let's whatever. The wins are going to come. I'm not super worried about it. Um, do we ask Daryl that or do we ask Zach that about like what would you care more about wins versus getting ready for playoffs? I think it was Daryl. It was Daryl. Um, to me, it's just getting ready for the playoffs. It just it's just it like the it's going to be such a um tight bunch at the end of the season with like seeds probably one or two through five yeah that like if you really want to make a push at the end of the season you can and get everybody get those wins whatever but like it's most it's so much more important to be like look you've lost as the one seed they've lost as the two seed they've lost it like they've they can find ways to lose in the playoffs they really need to just get there healthy and with a plan and with an identity and with like a way to do it and I just I'm f- I'm fine with them losing some games in the regular season to hopefully like be able to pull things out in the playoffs that they just have not in in past years and that like truly it sucks so bad that Paul Reed was as good as he was in the I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to do this forever. Spike, I'm going to do this forever. Paul Reed was their best defensive backup for Joel ever and doc played him like eight games in the regular season and had to be like dragged kicking and screaming to not play deandre jordan's rotting corpse in the fucking playoffs as they lost games because of him and paul was great he was exactly what they've been asking for not was he special probably not but he was capable he held down the fort it was fine and it is a total fucking indictment on everyone most importantly doc that they did not allow Paul to play more NBA basketball with his fucking teammates before he was asked to st- save eight to 10 minutes a game in the playoffs backing up to Ellen Bede. And he still did a fine fucking job. And so let's not get into ourselves into that goddamn situation this year. Okay, bud. <laughs> so that we can feel like we're not just skiing down a big mountain with our with the blindfold on. So let's use the regular season to fucking practice skiing. God. <laughs> Bud. <laughs> <laughs> I have to like hold your hand as we say, like, it's important that your players play if you're going to count on them in the playoffs. Huh? Bud. Um, Cornblow. And Cor- I, I got a note from Adam Cornblow, the official uh, lawyer of the process, official law firm of the process, giving me great news. Look, he doesn't want you to get injured in any way at all. Doesn't want you, Mike, me, you, the listener. But do you know, Mike, now that Cornblow is licensed to practice law in New York as well? Mm -hmm. So if you happen to be a Ricky listener who is in New York, may or may not have had uh, a couple of Ricky listeners reach out from New York, Cornblow can take care of New York, can take care of you in Jersey, can take care of you in PA. The only lawyer look he's the only lawyer you need he's the only personal injury lawyer that you need if you have any other you know lawyer type issue you reach out to cornblow but there's a uh, a reason that cornblow and cornblow has been able to get some of the biggest medical malpractice uh, results in southeastern pa there's a reason they've been around for 40 years it's because they get the job done cornblow 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 and cornblow uh, the, the law firm is full of corn plows was started by Adam's parents. Uh, Adam runs the law firm now with his mom. They, uh, I, I have always been like taken aback by Adam's passion for 
this sort of stuff. Um, personal injury lawsuits are complicated. They take a very long time. They can be remarkably frustrating. Um, but Adam is the one that you want by your side for a thing like that. He will keep you involved. He will keep you informed and he will get the job done for you. Now I mentioned medical malpractice. That is their number one specialty, but any sort of personal injury, injured at work, um, slip and fall, car accident, whatever it is, you reach out to Cornblow and Cornblow. It doesn't cost you anything until he gets you results. And as I've said before, if you have any other legal issue and many other Ricky listeners have reached out, he may not be able to represent you, but he can give you great advice and he can lead you in the right direction. He has done that many, many, many times for Rights to Ricky Sanchez listeners. Give him a call or shoot him an email if you think you have a case. It doesn't cost you anything. 215-576-7200. Ask for Adam. Email Cornblow at Cornblow and Cornblow.com. K-O-R-N-B-L-A-U. Cornblow and Cornblow, the official law firm of the process. Our friend Kevin O'Connor wrote a long feature on Daryl Morey. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Dropped it. Dropped it. Didn't even ask us. I thought it was good. I, with Sixer stuff, a lot of times I feel like I'm... I was like, ah, I know this, know this, know this, know this. Like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm reading something about my own life or something that, uh, that I already knew. I thought it painted Daryl in a, like a really good light. And it, it got me into thinking, do you, do you think the, the, not the casual NBA fan, because the casual NBA fan has basically zero opinion about a general manager that isn't the general manager of their team. Do you think the casual NBA fan as a positive view of Daryl Morey, A, as like a guy, and then B, as a general manager? I think as a general manager, absolutely. Okay. I think that, I guess, are, you know, you have to determine what, what your definition of a casual NBA fan Right, right, is. right, right. Yeah. But um, I think absolutely. Okay. I think he is, partially because he's just known People are just aware of him, and generally, when you feel like you have heard of an NBA GM, unless it's because of some like shocking scandal, none none would come to mind. <laughs> um, that like they're probably good, and he's just like you know he's wheeling and dealing. He has that reputation as like a long, you know, general manager coaching tree of you know people that worked for him that got jobs elsewhere and stuff. Um, as a guy, I don't know, and I don't know that the that KOC's article framed him in a, in a great light. I don't know. You that think? It, yeah, I mean, the parking ticket story is fucking weird. <laughs> Daryl, it's weird. Some of that I, stuff is weird. Maybe I feel like I've heard that him tell that story before. Maybe. I don't, it is, so for anybody who didn't read it, the parking ticket story is basically like, Maury got all of these parking tickets because he he kept leaving the car in places where that, that's what happens. You get a parking ticket. And so to avoid dealing, and then he got booted. And to avoid dealing with the parking tickets... He bought a new car and, and basically he asked them uh, if he could trade in that car and they said yes. And then they were like, all right, bring the car in. And he was like, it's booted here where, here's where it is, go get it. So he yeah. didn't have to deal with the parking tickets. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, on, on some level it's cool because like who, you know, fuck Lex. I don't care about Lexus being like the, like, or the parking enforcement people. Like that doesn't matter to me. So it's not like there's like, it's to me like a, I don't know, victimless situation, but like certainly a situation where I don't care about who was, uh, I don't know. Wrong. Nobody was harmed in this. No, nobody was harmed. But just it, like, it was something that if you're if you're a normal working class person, the idea would, of could buying do, yeah. a car. I to, think he's yeah. been like, I think Daryl is a nice guy. Now I'm just yes. talking, I'm talking to. I think on an interpersonal level, I he agree. is nice and he's warm and he's. Like you can very easy to have a conversation with. Yeah. But he I allows think us, by the way, a, to jab at him when he's on the podcast. Like m most general managers would not come on the pod and let two dipshits like make fun of him and, and question his moves di as directly, I think, as we do. But I think he's also not afraid to like look like a dick. And, right. look, and look like a little bit of an asshole in the sense. Mm. And that's part of like, yeah, like, I'll just tell Lexus, go get it. You want this? Go fucking take my booted car. <laughs> and I think a little bit that was part of like why he was like firm about in the Ben Simmons like standoff. 
Hmm. Because he's like, I'm not afraid to look like a dick and being like, well, this is not in my best interest. And so I'm not going to do it. It's in my best interest for Ben Simmons to go fucking tow, tow my car himself. I don't fucking need to go get it for him. You go get it. <laughs> and so I, I think it's it's just, he's just an interesting person in that sense to be both like on on a conversational level able to have that, like be able to talk like that, but also... Yeah, he's just, I'm just, I'm not like, I'm not like that at all. I would, yeah, he's just a unique guy. And I think being like wealthy and then now like powerful for a long time and like an important position has allowed him to do that. And like, if, if I did that, I think I would be like, a lot, get a lot more like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> but when Dow does it, it's like, all right, it's kind of like a interesting, interesting thing. Kind of what, what if. What an interesting choice for this man to make. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm amused by it in a sense, and I will do what he asks. Yeah, uh, that's that's interesting that you didn't. I I thought maybe I thought for me the reason that it 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 I thought I painted him in a good light is that it he is a a caricature to a certain extent. I mean, we all are. Any any public figure ends up being a caricature of themselves. And to your point, I thought some of the things in the article. Uh, reinforce a caricature, but I thought it also added depth. And I think any time that a, a profile, and I think this is what they're meant to do sometimes, can paint somebody, can give people more context on things and become more of a human, that it makes them more likable. But I, I was curious. Yeah, I, I guess I, like- I think I think it's clear that Kevin likes him. Yes, that is a good point. That's Coming good point. through. Yeah. I think that's for sure. Yeah. Well, right. he does it. He's a, does a good job because he talks. So he does a good job of making media like him a oh, lot because he sorry. talks. You know, I really liked the. There was a Harden quote in there that I really liked. Yeah, and I wanted to like just hear more about it and like watch them talk to each other, like on a couch, and just be like, "Yeah, you know, why is that?" The is it the is, one where Harden doesn't know why yeah, they have a good relationship? I wrote, I wrote <laughs> yeah. The quote is, "We got a weird relationship, but it makes sense." I'm still trying to figure it out. Harden says, <laughs> "I don't know what it is, but we have a connection and it just works." Yeah, which I think is just funny. I think he's like, "I should fucking hate this dude. Like, I should want to like give him a wedgie. I should want to like throw him off a like off a boat. Like, fuck him. I, the way he talks, what a weirdo." But I don't know. I like him, I guess. I don't know why. I don't know why that is. But like, it's funny to hear them imagine and be like, why should I dislike you, Daryl? Like, what, what is that conversation like? It's, uh, I thought that was pretty funny. And, and for two guys that are ostensibly very different, like that have been, you know, working together for as long as they have and all that stuff, it seems like they enjoy each other's company and, and want to be around each other, which is, which is, uh, you know, unique and interesting. I would have to imagine that part of the reason Hardum likes him so much is because he does whatever Harden wants. <laughs> he gets him the players that he wants. It, I mean, Harden, it, I guess all stars do, but Harden did yeah. seem like he had the run of the place in Houston a little bit too, you know? Yeah, but I think it's kind of who doesn't. I don't, yeah. I don't think that, yeah. that Daryl treats Harden so much differently than other GMs would have. I mean, the decisions would have been different, for sure, but I think like it still would have been like, how do we cater to this person that is the you know the center of our team's gravity? Right, Ricky Sanchez at Gmail. We got a a call last night that I had to play for you. I was really curious about your uh, your reaction to it. You can get to us at rights to Ricky Sanchez at Gmail dot com or leave us a voicemail at eight three three lickface. That's eight three three lickface. Brian from Maryland. End of the third quarter and beat old antics. When do you and Mike turn full heel on Embiid and realize he's the Donovan McNabb of the Sixers? Oh, <laughs> it hurts a little too much. No, I don't know. I love I love Donovan when he was when he was here. the The last couple of years were bad, but I was a big I was a big Donovan guy for a while. Um, Look, I love Donovan, and he is the the best quarterback in the history of the Eagles. Well, yeah, I mean, the best quarterback in the history of the Eagles for sure. The the like good, but not quite good enough, and then the the he's not he's better than Donovan. I mean, it's yes, obviously, but he's 100%. better in context of his job that than Donovan ever was at his job. 
Yeah, the, I mean, there were a couple of years where Donovan was pretty fucking awesome, though. Sure. The, the height of his, and I think in those couple of years, you could have argued that Donovan was like, I don't know, top three or four quarterback in the NFL in those couple of years. I mean, it's cover of SI, MVP, you know, conversation, that sort of stuff. I think he was top six, right? At the time. I think we're misremembering it if we if we don't think that he was. I think top I think top six is fair. Top three, I think, would have been pushing it. Okay. In, in the conversation. Usually I would say usually in the like six to twelve range, but a couple a couple times pushing pushing the high end of that. The memory is I, I guess the comparison is good but not quite good enough to get it done. Yeah. Is the thing that that hurts. Donovan had better ball security than Joel does. Yeah, that's definitely for sure. Uh, maybe I loved I love that touchdown interception ratio. Come on. Maybe uh, Embiid has to start throwing the ball right into the ground. So it doesn't it, get picked off. Yeah. Some warm warm burners. It should yeah. not surprise you that I did bring up Bobby Rayo to Jake. Oh uh, yeah. Of course. At 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 the bar. Was Jake even alive when Bobby Bray was playing? I mean, twenty six. Of course okay. he was. Yeah, Sixers Adam. I don't know. Sixers Adam. We. I have to have a conversation with Sixers Adam about Bobby Bray, but <laughs> yeah, guy's the man. And I don't think th- I don't think I'm. I'm. It's many years. Look, I can be critical of Embiid for the few things that he's not good at, and I am. Um, but he's not Don. He's not Donovan, and he, and I like Donovan, but he's he's already. Hand, head and shoulders above above the kind of player he was. And I'll leave you with this. This is an email we got from Steve, writes to Ricky Sanchez at gmail.com. This comes out of nowhere, but it, it's a, if I don't get to this email, I'm never going to get to it. And I feel like this is an email I need to present to you. From Steve, a slight defense of Tommy Alter. Oh, no. <laughs> we say the main job of an NBA coach is to, quote, manage egos. It's a critical role that lets the talent do its job on the court. Why can't that logic be in podcasting too? Maybe Tommy Alter is the Phil Jackson of podcasting. Tommy may not be independently worthy of hosting a podcast or adept at shooting a basketball, but he seems quite able to manage all of the egos that come and go on that podcast. Why is that mocked rather than appreciated? I mean, isn't it possible? You could get, you could find like a babysitter, like college kids nanny. No, I mean, make everybody feel good though. I mean, maybe Tommy Alter's the guy there. Just be the butt of the joke when he needs to be. It's like, ha, 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 look guys, I can't even shoot. You guys are so good at basketball and look at me. I can't even shoot. No, totally. I guess that's just not, to me, that's not like a a special skill that like (laughs) earns him where he is where is he even though i don't know and i don't know how <laughs> and i'm certain i don't know why this I, i'm I, there's a real chance that tommy and i's paths cross at some point yes and very, very real either in sports or in like television in my real Love. job oh yeah and i don't know why this is the one that i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna go for it i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna not I'm going to not care and I'm going to say whatever the fuck I want. And I, I don't know what it is, but I know it's going to come back to bite me. And I'm, I think I just have to be okay with that. I have well, to. it's too late. That, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that is also true. It is yeah. I, it's too late. So I should be okay with it because I've already made my bet. Yeah. Because no matter how, even if you turn the corner on Tommy out there, there's three years of, <laughs> of podcast. <laughs> you mean a fucking yeah. asshole about it. Well, maybe Tommy's a, a Daryl Morey type and doesn't mind <laughs> making fun of himself. And, uh, and I would be charmed by him if, if we, if we ever were to meet. Uh, well, the good news for the Sixers after this tough game against this Eastern Conference powerhouse, the Celtics. But not is, on a court. If we ever met on a court, like if he was, if he happened to like fall ass backwards into a game that I was in, I would have to, I would have to like really, I would, I just think about his shot. Think about his little jab step. <laughs> he's, he's traveling on all of those. It's a walk. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, luckily for the Sixers, uh, it gets easy as the second game of the season is against the Celtics. So no problems whatsoever, but then San Antonio. So um, the season has begun. Here we are. I felt. It's, it's baseball season, baby. Yeah. Catch uh, me in the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> Minus 185 favorite at DraftKings to win the uh to win the series. The Sixers I'm a, are right now. I'm a baseball fan and an adult women's rec league basketball coach. <laughs> Those are the only things that I can identify as. We oh um 
Hey, I'll, I'll see Bark in the Park is Saturday at Rose Tree Park in Media. We have, um, I think like 70 people on our team. We've raised, hold on, $14,675. So we have 13, I want to get to 16,000. So $1,325 to go. If you get a moment, we'll put the link in this pod, please. Uh, if you can donate 20 bucks or something, get us to the goal. And it truly a huge thank you to the the team sponsors, uh, Mortgage CS, LL Pavorsky, Body Bio, Briggs Auction, DraftKings um, have all made separate donations. So that's even a separate bucket. So thank you to everyone who does. And it looks like it's going to be a nice day on Saturday. So look forward to, uh, to seeing everyone. I get to pick up my Briggs Auction winnings on Saturday. As Steve from Briggs Auction is going to bring them. So I'm excited for that. My weird Elvis stuff and the 70s, anti-Vietnam posters and stuff like that. So I'm glad for everything I've wanted to break. So, um, all right, we will. the next podcast, we do a full hour on the Michael Foster Jr. two-way. So we, which we have not done yet. We, we haven't done it. Talked about it at all. A lot to talk about still. There's always <laughs> two podcasts a week and there's always le- leaving some meat on the bone. <laughs> we'll talk to you this weekend. Are you done with TTP? Yeah, you know, lick face. If you don't fuck with me, then I, then I won't, won't fuck, fuck with you. you. If you don't fuck with me, then I won't fuck with you. But if you fuck with me, I'm gonna fucking kill you! That's a friend.